compass and true bearings. You guys are going to be learning how to apply compass and true bearings to application problems. Okay. Application problems are our word problems. So, it's, you know, they'll be talking about like a, a ship that's traveling or, you know, a plane that's flying, stuff like that. Okay. And so it's important that you know, one, what are the different compass points so you can create an accurate picture or you know how to label your picture as well as true bearings. So to start, we'll talk about the compass points. That's north, that's east, south, and west. Hopefully everybody has seen these, I think so. Um, when you have compass points written, uh, you either ha you'll have one direction followed by an angle followed by another direction. The basically the creation of the compass points essentially tell you where you're starting, which direction you're heading, and then how far you're heading in that direction. So when you see north 40 degrees east, that means you're starting in the north position, which is that um, straight up vertical one, and then you're heading to the east direction 40 degrees. So then that would essentially create this angle right here. So from the north, we turn 40 degrees to the east direction, and that is north 40 degrees east. Similarly, west 20 degrees south, we start in that west direction, and then we're heading south 20 degrees. So from the west direction, we go down towards the south 20 degrees. Very common uh, compass points, northwest, southeast, you know, the ones that are, you know, two, two of the compass points combined together, that literally means that it's, it's split in half. So that really is 45 degrees both directions, either west 45 degrees north or north 45 degrees west. But these are your different compass points. And these, this writing, the setup for the angle can be used in your application problems when describing how some, how some object is traveling. Questions about compass points. Three figure bearings, also known as true bearings, give direction as well in, as an angle. However, it is measured clockwise from the north direction, okay? That's what three figure bearings or true bearings, um, that's how you can determine angles that way. They come from a north direction and they head clockwise. They're always given with three numbers. So if your number is less than 100, you always include a zero in front that zero does not count as a significant figure. Remember, you always start with your first non-zero number to count your significant figures. However, because you are dealing with true bearings, they need to have three, three numbers there. So anything less than 100, you need to have a zero. So zero 35 degrees would be from the north direction, 35 degrees heading clockwise, or 110 degrees, Again, from the north direction, heading clockwise, 110 degrees. Okay, first off, or actually, let me just make sure everybody understands, this here, if I head from the north direction going to this point, how many degrees is that? Mm -mm. It'll be 90, okay? It'll be 90, so realize when you go essentially like a quarter of the way, you're going 90 degrees, okay? 90 degrees, what about here? If I start from the north direction, head all the way to the bottom, how many degrees is that? 180. And then if I go three quarters of the way? 270, okay? Of course, this is heading in the clockwise direction. That's why 110 is after 90, because we've gone more than 90 degrees. This is a little bit more than, than 90. Lastly, 270 degrees. Again, all these are representing true bearings. You start in the north 
spot in that north direction and you head clockwise, that means degrees. So that's 90, 180, and you end at 270. Questions on these? So let's take a look at this example. Yes, you are going to have to write down this example. It is a paper two type of question, which means it's your long response. But this is going to be the only example because it covers everything that I need to essentially cover when it comes to compass points and true bearings. Okay, so go ahead and get this down. So a ship is sailing north from point A towards point B. Okay, so if you had to recreate this yourself, you know that you would have to have two things. One, you have to have a point A, and then you would have to draw that vertical line heading up to represent that north direction, and then on that line should be a point D. Now, point C is 175 kilometers north of A, and then you're told that point D is 60 kilometers north of C. So even if you had to recreate this yourself, if you try to say, okay, well, A is here, D is here, and then if you try to put C there, you would know based off of that second sentence or that third sentence that it would be the other way. D, it would have to go A, then C, then D. Okay? Does everybody understand those first three sentences? Then it says, there's an island at E. The bearing of E from A is 0, 0.55 degrees. Bearing, 0, 0.55, they're talking about true bearings. Remember, true bearings come from the north heading clockwise. So clockwise from that line is 55 degrees, and then at 55 degrees, E is located somewhere along that line, 55 degrees at an angle from A. Does everybody understand that sentence? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then it says a bearing of E from C is 134 degrees. So from C to E, the bearing is 135, a, a 134. So again, from a north direction at C going towards E is 134 degrees. This information is shown in the diagram. But if you had to recreate that yourself, you would need to be able to piece that all together. Questions on the diagram. So now let's get to some of these questions. Find the bearing of A from E. Find the bearing of A from E. So essentially from E, what degree will we have to go to get to A? So remember, it's asking for a bearing. Bearings always come from what direction? The north direction. So from E, I'm just gonna kind of draw like a little dotted line to represent the north. And then we head what direction? To the right, we head clockwise. So from this north direction, heading clockwise, to get to A, they're asking me for this pink angle right here. That's what AA is asking for. So the bearing of A from E, so from E to A was that bearing, all right? Anybody have any suggestions? So from your geometry days, there were such things called transversals and parallel lines that created those special types of angles, right? And the thing is that if you have a north, like two lines that are both heading north, then they're gonna be parallel because north is, no matter where you draw north, is always gonna be parallel. So you have two parallel lines here, CE as well as AE serve as transversals. And the thing is, is that these, or I'm gonna do it in color, this angle and this angle were what? I think it's corresponding. Now, corresponding. Congruent. Okay.
well, they, they, they are congruent, but it's because they were alternate interior angles. So if you have alternate interior angles, which we have for the, our two parallel lines and AE serving as our transversal, that means that this angle right on the inside is also 55 degrees. And then what about the remainder? What about this part right here? That's 180 degrees. Well, not, not minus anything, but just 180 plus 55. And what's that? Um, 235. 235 degrees, and that would be our bearing of A from E. Now, we also could have found angle C, E, A, and then we could have also figured out what this angle was right here, added those two angles up, subtracted from 360, and we would get our answer that way as well. Questions? Let's find CE. Let's find this side length right here, okay? Um, this is where I need my additional information. What's angle ACE? What's this angle right in here? 46. And we know it's 46 degrees because that's a straight line. It's 108 degrees in a straight line. If this angle is 46 and angle A is 55, what's the remaining measure of the angle in that triangle? 79. So then to find CE, I'm going to have to use law Law of signs because I have B because I have 175 and the angle across from it now. And I'm looking for CE and I know the angle across from CE. Go ahead and find CE. And so it's going to be 146 kilometers. Okay, because remember you cross multiply and then divide, so it's going to be 175 sine of 55 all over the sine of 79. Good stuff. Now it's asking us to find DE. DE is not actually physically on our picture, but it doesn't mean that we can't draw it. Okay. We want to know what it is from here to here. We want to know that measure. Okay. We want to find that measure. How will we do that? You already know. Can I find a e? You use the two sides and included angle. I use the two sides and the included angle. Because I know DC is 60. I know this angle is 134. And I just found that EC was 146. Of course, we're not going to use the rounded answer. And then we're going to use law of cosines. So that's going to be 60 squared plus that 146 number squared minus 2 times 60 times 146, the non-rounded answer, of course. Make sure you take the square root after you do all of that. Let's find DE. What is the length of DE? 112? Yeah. I got 193. 193. Ooh. Well, I'm sure you, I got 193. Okay. Hold on. All right. So 193. DE is 193. Okay. 193 kilometers. 
Now for part D, I don't have any space, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. Part D, it says the sh when the ship reaches D, it changes directions and travels to the island at 50 kilometers per hour. So again, once it gets to D, it's gonna travel to the island, and we already know that DE was how long again? 193, okay? That's how, that's how far the ship has to travel. But it's traveling at 50 kilometers per hour. At the same time as the ship changes directions, a boat starts traveling to the island from point D. Do you notice there's no point B on this picture? But then you're told that this point B lies on AC between A and C, and is the closest point to the island. Wouldn't it be the midpoint? Um, would it be the midpoint? Not necessarily the midpoint, but it is going to be a point on AC that's going to be the shortest distance along this line that's the closest to E. That distance, oops, or the drawn line, This line is perpendicular to AC. This goes back to geometry. The shortest distance between a line and a point is the segment that's perpendicular, that connects them that's perpendicular. If we have put that point anywhere else along that line, it's gonna be a further distance than the line that makes a 90 degree angle. Does everybody understand that? So it makes a right triangle. So it makes a right triangle. And we know a lot of this information from uh, the previous parts. Like we know that CE was 146, right? Okay, and we also knew that this angle uh, ACE was 46. Wait, what, what was CE? What was CE? So CE was 146, and then what was angle ACE? 46. Oh, it was, okay, so it was 46. All right. So we already know a lot of information already. So let's actually figure out what is the question. The ship and the boat arrive at the island at the same time. We want to find the speed of the boat. So again, the boat is leaving from this point, heading straight to the island, and it's going a particular speed that when the ship gets there, the boat gets there at the same time. So to connect all these pieces to help you find the speed of the boat, you need to know a few things. One, you need to know how far the boat had to travel to get to E. Okay, so that's one thing we need to find. We need to figure out how far the boat traveled because we need this distance. We also need to know how long it took for the ship to get to the island. Because remember, the ship and the boat arrive at the same time, so you gotta know how long it took the ship to get there because that time is gonna be the same amount of time that the boat is gonna take to get there. So you need to also figure out the time it took how long it took for the ship to get to the island. Once you know that, then you're going to be able to answer the final question, which is to find the speed of the boat. What old school formula do I need that connects distance, time, and speed? What old school formula connects those three pieces together? It's also something you need to know for your SAT and ACT. 
It is distance equals speed times time. However, however fast you're going times however long you drive that speed will get you how far you can cover. This can be altered to say that if I have to travel a certain distance and I divide it by a particular speed that I'm going, I'm able to figure out how long it's going to take me to get somewhere. But the four GPS is exactly how people figured out, okay, well, I'm trying to make it home to North Carolina by eight o'clock. I know I can only go 75 miles per hour on I-95. North Carolina is this far away, okay? Exactly how long is it gonna take me to get, to get home? That's what people did before GPS. Grain, of course, has taken out every other element there is. Traffic, construction, accidents, stopping to use the bathroom. At least it gave you, it gave you an estimate, basically. So this formula right here is what you need to be able to determine uh, the speed of the boat, okay? The speed of the boat. Uh, as well as the time it took for the ship to get to the island, okay? So you'll need that formula for two as well as for three. So let's figure out how far the boat had to travel. Someone said it earlier, but this creates a right triangle between B, C, and E. I want to find BE. I already know that this angle up here is 46 and that CE is 146 and some change. How do I find BE? Which one? Sine, cosine, or tangent? Sine. I want to use sine because BE is my opposite side and CE is my hypotenuse. So to find BE, how far the boat had to travel to get to the island, I'm going to take that non-rounded answer and multiply it by the sine of 46. You guys go ahead and do that. When you have the answer, let me know. Say it again. 105. 105? Okay. So, we need that information. Now, we also need the information, the time it took for the ship to get to the island. That's what we're going to use this formula. For the ship to get to the island, they traveled 193 and some change kilometers. How fast were they traveling? 50 kilometers per hour. So my speed is gonna be 50 and I'm looking for my time. So how do I figure out how long it takes for the ship to get to the island? What do I need to do? I need to divide by 50. So take that non-rounded answer and divide it by 50, and let's figure out how long it took for this uh, ship to get to the island. So it takes 3.85 hours for the ship to make it to the island. Now, I needed one and two to answer the actual question that D is asking me for, because it's asking me for the speed of the boat. Well, in order for me to find the speed of the boat, I need to, I need to know the distance the boat traveled, and I need to know the time it took for the boat to get to the island. And since the ship and the boat are arriving at the same time, 
I needed the time for the ship because it's the exact same time for the boat. So distance is that 105 non-rounded number. I'm looking for the speed and the time is that 3.85 number, of course, unrounded. So to find the speed of the boat, the actual answer to the question in part D, I need to divide that 108 number by that 3.85 number. Let me know what you get. How fast is the boat going to arrive at the same time to the island that the ship does? That's what I got. So Me too. The, so the speed that the boat has got to be traveling is 27.3 kilometers per hour to arrive at the island the same time that the ship does. And that's how you, one, incorporate bearings into a word problem, okay, into an application problem. It involves the tr uh, trigonometry part of what we were doing in part one, okay? And it also incorporates that, again, that equation in the black. Please make sure you know that for your SAT and ACT. And also for life in general, in case your phone happens to die and you need to figure out exactly how long it's going to take you before you reach civilization or something. All right? Look at number one from this, uh, this assignment, the application of geometry and trig. It says a solid glass paperweight consists of a hemisphere of diameter six centimeters on top of a cuboid with a square base and a length six centimeters as shown in the diagram. I'm reading this straight off of the, the actual assignment because I know I don't have any of that up here. Just trying to save space. That is the diagram. The height of the cuboid, x centimeters, is equal to the height of the hemisphere. Equal to the height of the hemisphere. Write down the value of x. Well, if a hemisphere is nothing but half of a sphere, and you know that the diameter of the hemisphere is 6, so then what is going to be the height of the hemisphere? It's a write down problem, so it's little to no work. It would be three. It would be three. So that means because it's half, yes. Think about it. A hemisphere is half of a sphere. So if you're looking at the full sphere, it's saying that this right here is six. But remember, any point from the center to the edge of that sphere is going to represent the radius. And of course, the radius is going to be three if the diameter is six. So that was 1a. Value of x is three, three centimeters. Now it's asking you to calculate the volume of the paperweight. Well, the paperweight consists of two shapes. And if we're talking about volume, you need the equation for volume of those two shapes. What's the equation for volume of a hemisphere? So V equals four to three pi R. You would take the volume of a sphere and divide it by two because a hemisphere is half of a sphere. So volume it works the same way. Then you need the volume of a cuboid. A cuboid is nothing but a prism. How do you find the volume of a prism? Of a cube. Many times high times what? Times width. Or base times height. Or base times height times width. Something. 
These are all, all three of those dimensions. What's the radius of my hemisphere? I'm going to cube it, divided by two. Then I need the length, the width, and the height of the cuboid. Well, that's nothing but six times six times three. So I type that in, get my answer. Let me know when you have it. So it should be 165. Uh, not sure how you might have gotten the other one. Just make sure that if you, let's say you did that entire fraction together, uh, just make sure that you include parentheses around the entire numerator. So even if you were using that fraction feature, four over three, pi, three to the third, close it off, then divide by two. Otherwise, it's going to I think reorder of operations and, and potentially could get you the wrong thing. I'll have to see your calculator to see exactly what you did. Uh, what are my units? Centimeters. Q, because I am talking about volume. Then it said. Centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed. And you're talking about in the calculator, how do we do the cube? Yeah. You go to the carrot button right here underneath the clear. And then it'll go up into the X on it. Oh, okay. And then you just want to make sure that you press the right arrow so it, it takes you out of the X on it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, then for C, it says one centimeter cube of glass has a mass of 256 grams. Okay. Calculate the mass in grams of the paperweight. So it would just be 165 times 2.5. 165 times 2.5. Five, six? Yes, it would be. Because uh, remember, if you have a one centimeter cube, it's 2.56 grams. And if we have 165, or the, you know, the non random answer, you're trying to figure out, okay, well, exactly how many grams that would be. You can set up a proportion, or you can just recognize you just need to multiply. Uh, that's it exact, but it's only four. Numbers, but I, do three um, I, would, I would do three significant figures. Because are you sure even with the round, the non-rounded answer? Or did you use the round answer? Yeah, so do three significant figures. What is the weight? It gives you a whole different answer. The non-rounded. So. Ooh. What is it? With, if you use the rounded, it's four. 122.4 if you use a non-rounded, it's 421.2. Okay, so then it's going to be 421 grams. And that's why it's important. I don't know if y'all heard what, um, what Danielle was saying, but she was like, if you use the rounded answer, it gives you, you said 424? Yeah, 422.4. Oh, 422.4. Use the full, it's 421. Okay? So remember, don't. Round prematurely. But that's how we can incorporate volume and surface area into an application problem. Here we're talking about paperweights. Yes. Okay. But that's pretty much the bulk of the application part. It really is, you know, just applying the concepts into these word problems, trying to figure out, okay, what exactly is the question asking for? Now you can incorporate compass points and bearings as well into some of those trig uh, trigonometry problems. And then of course you have your surface area and your volume questions.